Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Lyle, and I'm the Programs Manager of the Arts Club of Chicago. And I'm so happy to be talking with all these fabulous people today about nothing, uh, the void, if you will. Quick note, please feel free to add any questions you might have to the chat here on YouTube, and we will get to them at the end of the program. Um, for performers, an empty stage is pretty standard, right? We are used to filling spaces. Sometimes even with an audience present, we pretend they don't exist. Like sometimes we just ignore them. So in theory, emptiness is nothing new, but obviously this is a different moment. Um, the Arts Club, unable to host audiences during quarantine, decided to host artists instead, asking them to make work for the empty space and for an absent audience in a project that we called Tiny Performances in Empty Rooms. It was streamed in February through the Arts Club and also last night through the Expo Chicago microsite. And I believe you can see it um, for the rest of the fair. Kate sears in all of her wonderful artistic curio curiosity gave us this platform to do some deep thinking about that project in its aftermath. You know, when you're producing a thing, you can easily develop tunnel vision around just getting the thing done. And this has been a really wonderful opportunity to reflect on the implications of what we've made, given a little bit of time to process what happened. So I'm very thankful to Kate and to Tony and to Expo Chicago for offering this space. Now, for the Tiny Performances Project, I invited artists who I knew to be abstract thinkers and improvisers who might be excited to think about this incredibly strange, possibly, hopefully, never to be experienced again, nature of this very specific situation, and to maybe help me think about how emptiness in this situation is different from others. And what they each chose to engage with, as you likely saw in the video streamed earlier, varied quite widely from person to person. So I will introduce those people right now. Angel Batawid is a Black American composer, improviser, clarinetist, pianist, vocalist, and DJ whose newly composed sonata for an empty room was recorded for tiny performances in empty rooms with fellow multi-instrumentalist composer, performer, improviser, everything person, Isaiah Collier. And Jasmine Mendoza is a visual and performance artist who creates and performs multimedia performance, incorporating improvisation, sound, film, objects, and theatrical play. And for Tiny Performances, Jasmine collaborated on a piece titled Whir, W-H-I-R, with filmmaker Keaton Fox, who seems to be similarly inclined toward play and perceptual inquiry. Kurt Chang is a theater artist, writer, and performer. He is artistic director emeritus and ensemble of the neo-futurist theater, where over the course of a decade with the company, he wrote and directed multiple premieres, produced and curated work, and created over 300 two-minute plays for the acclaimed ever-evolving show, The, Infer the Infinite Wrench. Uh, his contribution to Tiny Performances was a film project with performer and ecstatic mover Livia Chesley titled Livia to the Stage, please, period, Livia to the Stage. And we're going to hear more about all of this, but first, so you can get to know these artists a little bit more deeply, <clears throat> Angel, Kurt, Jasmine, I'd like to ask you each to discuss something you were up to before this project came around, like perhaps also dealing with the situation we found ourselves in for the past year. Uh, Angel, I'm gonna start with you. I know you developed a practice during quarantine of producing musical hangs outside, and we got a taste of what that was like at the end of your sonata for an empty room. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Royal Sessions. Yeah, so Royal Sessions happen, um, you know, like, first of all, the Sonata is a journey, like, um, the reason why I did it with Isaiah Collier was because we were in Mexico, right before the quarantine, and like, right when we got off the plane, it was quarantine, it was like a whole nother universe, and so uh, the Sonata was exploring that, and by the time it was summer, we were like, we have nowhere to really 
play music because, you know, it was not safe to have gatherings. And so, um, you know, we had done like a protest march, um, like around 58th and Stony Island. We just took our instruments and we marched from there to the Sable Museum and we just played like a loud sound because, you know, like in the summer, it was like really heated. Y'all know everything was going on, George Floyd, all this. It was just like over the top. And so that meeting place where the protest started, there's a beautiful park, a beautiful garden. And um, Isaiah had been going there just to play his horn and practice. And he just started inviting people to come like, hey, let's just play in the park. And people, if they want to come and listen, they can. There was enough room to social distance, you know, so people would bring their blankets out and it, it would just be a beautiful time of us just sharing music. Um, just to play together, but also to share with the world. A lot of people were coming up to us like, you guys don't realize we haven't heard any live music in like eight months. Like you guys are the first like live anything we've heard. And so it made, made it really, really special um, during the summer and it's something that's ongoing. So by the time, you know, I get to the, my composition, it, it made so much sense that the last movement would be a, roy a mini royal session, <laughs> you know, um, in that empty room, in that space, in that building, because that's actually, you know, as horrible and traumatic as everything it is right now in this world that we live in. Um, the fact that something so beautiful um, came out of that, which is one of the great things about us talking about voids and, and, and um, emptiness, because most creation stories, mythologies start with a void with an emptiness. And I think like we're, we're looking at it, we have to look at it in so many different ways. Like we have to look at it like, okay, we've, this void has happened, but void is also the breeding ground for creation and creating something new and different, you know? So like we're getting off the plane from Mexico into void, you know, but it birthed these Royal sessions. And it, <laughs> we have to like think like, okay, now what are these sessions birthing forth? And that's, that's like this continual thing with my work. It's like, it has to be like a, you know, that's how creation works, void and then boom, baby, you know? So. Thank you for that, Angel. You're welcome. Uh, and I, <laughs> I'd like now to hear a little bit from Kurt I know the neo-futurists have also been presenting work over the past year, even with the neo-futurarium, like so many other venues in a dormant state. Uh, can you talk about the home weekly show with the neos? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, my, my journey of last year along inside of Chicago, inside of COVID-19 um, and the pandemic, uh, uh, was a, a kind of, you know, Angel, you're talking about rebirthing or like birthing or coming out of a void or like transitions. Um, I was actually in the mode of transitioning uh, after 12 years of being, of having the neo-futurist be my artist, my, my sole artistic home. Um, and as, as I was transitioning out, the pandemic was happening at the same time and completely reinventing the way that the show had to, the way that we do our work. Um, for those of anyone who doesn't know, the neo-futurists are a group of experimental theater practitioners. We do a weekly show called The Infinite Wrench, and that is indeed weekly, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, late at night, every single weekend since 1988. Uh, when it was called Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind. Um, it is a regular ongoing practice to create many, many two minute plays, roughly two minute plays, um, uh, we weekly for a live uh, rip roaring audience, um, unhinged and uh, 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 from all, all wakes of life as it were. Um, I, so I, I frame it that way because, you know, for the past 12 years, I've been making, I've been in a regular practice of creating work that is experimental, that is completely new, that is from me, uh, that is that is for and 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 is in need of an audience in front of me, um, and that goes with everyone that's an ensemble member of the neo futurists. So with the pandemic, when the pandemic comes in, the fundamental, a fundamental tenet 
of being able to make quote unquote neo-futurist work, um, which is uh, uh, about this audience performer relationship is suddenly cut completely uh, severed. Um, and then we have to figure out a way to, but another, another important part of making this kind of work is that it's regular, it's ongoing, and it's speaking to the live, immediate, relevant world. And that, you know, again, there's plenty, there is, a, there was and, ha and continues to be plenty going on in, in the 2020, 2021 year. Um, so uh, as far as what the NEOs are doing, like we continue to do the work over a online platform. Uh, we continue to make 30 plays every single week that were brand new and made from the ensemble performing it, it, in the show on any given weekend. Um, and instead of plays, they were, well, they remained plays, but they wound up on uh, YouTube. They were adapted into videos. Um, so, and then audience can tune in and check out all the new plays, new videos that are made on every given weekend. Um, so uh, as far as my work, how that translated for me in creating towards the three, the not three arts, but arts club of Chicago piece. Um, yeah, it's tricky. Uh, is that um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a theater maker first. Um, which translates in like plays around and has a relationship to the film arts and the film industry, of course. Uh, but it was important for me to be able to look at and create something from a theatrical lens. So that like, so I ask myself, what's the thing that the audience, you know, how am I gonna reach the audience in this way that feels dramatic and actionable? which I think are words that we associate with going to a live place to see theater. Um, and for me, my answer was, okay, then, and to face it honestly, I just had to do something. Uh, uh, I, had, I had to address the room as it was, which is that no audience was there. Um, and use everything about no audience being there, the fact that no audience is there, use everything about that to inform exactly what is in the piece. And that had to do with work I was making in the neo-futurists, you know, in the fall. And then I used that like same kind of idea towards making for this. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was an important question because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to, I wasn't as interested in making something under the, the constraints that come with filmmaking. Not because I don't think I could like try it out, but I wanted to like add theater to the world, even though it was impossible to do. So what do you make when theater is impossible to do? And then we find, and then I find out what, what I'm making. And so I think like, as we continue on, that's been like, I think places all over the city and all over the country and the world have been playing with that idea um, in some ways, in some ways more successful than others, but it was something I wanted to like continue to try and continue to do. What do you make when theater is impossible to do and how do you lean into the fact that there's no one there? Right. I mean, and I do think that the whole, um, like the, eth the sort of ethos of this project in general was pretty DIY. It was like, we, we have this space and that's, you know, and then we have some gear, but that's it. And so it felt like we were all kind of making as best we could for the situation. And weirdly in the production, that feels theatrical in and of itself, like the production methods. Right. Thank you for that, Kurt. Mm -hmm. And Jasmine, uh, you've been working on a project with fellow hyphenate performing artists, Leah Cole and Corey Smith. Uh, revolving around what you've called prompts that you develop together <clears throat> around nothingness. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, Leah, Corey, and I started working together. Um, I mean, we started like really getting into rehearsals together um, in January. So it was like, we really started 
to kind of get on this um get into this like place together and then that all kind of got taken away um but we these ideas kind of stem from this uh fascination and kind of like obsession this weird obsession that we all have with chairs like just like a physical chair and like its structure um and like the architecture of a chair and the way it holds the body um and so that was kind of like the um kind of like tipping off point of um of this process together and you know this this void that we entered um there was a lot of space um in this project and uh we kind of have just got back into this really beautiful place of creating these um like multimedia uh, movement sound like documentations of different prompt ideas um it can be you know like for instance uh, we each created this these drawings um, of a room um you know we were just like let's let's create a room that we you know want to be inside of and so that kind of like trickle down into um let's imagine our bodies in this room is there sound in this room like what are we hearing so like kind of like reigniting and reawakening these possibilities of play that as an improviser um it's been so uh be like beyond difficult to reimagining reimagine uh, these areas of possibility and play when things have been so limited and constricted um, and have felt very like unsafe, you know, like how do you go into play when you're uh, just trying to survive, you know? So, yeah, I mean, um, we got into Acre, so we'll be working at Acre next summer, um, which is really exciting um and just kind of really toying around with the idea of like you know i don't know what this is right now but that feels really exciting and great and we're creating and documenting all of these different prompts and ideas together that feel um like a breath of fresh air honestly thank you jasmine so i'm hearing from you this idea of like imagining something that isn't what we're in at the moment, imagining something that feels kind of utopian for a future. I love that. So you're reimagining Kurt is basically problem solving <laughs> and Angel is dealing with like this mythological precedent for the void as a place from which new birth occurs. And then furthermore, this is like a wild moment where it's really easy to feel like we're consuming like everything and nothing and every place we would normally go is empty, but our most intimate environments are intensely and maybe overwhelmingly full. And this past year has presented a lot of opportunities, I guess, to re-examine the nature of nothingness. And so, like not to get just super Nietzschean on everyone, but um, as an artist, do you think it's even possible to perceive nothingness as such? Um, Angel, I'm gonna go to you. I'll throw that question to you, Angel. I think you're still muted, but while you work on that for a sec, I'll um I'll throw it to Kurt. Okay, you gotta repeat the question then. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Oh my goodness. Oh, I don't know how to take my phone. She's here. Me? I'm so sorry. You're good. Go ahead, Kurt. Go ahead. Yeah, tell me the question again, Jenna. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, as an artist, do you think it's even possible to like perceive nothingness and emptiness as such? As as uh, as as such. As such. Like, is anything that's empty actually totally empty? Oh yeah, I mean totally. I mean, we just dem it was just demonstrated two seconds ago when like <laughs> like emptiness absolutely can exist. And like as this was happening, this kind of snafu with the with the stuff, 
I was thinking of like a fund a fundamental thing for me about what is created or how to make theater or even live performance um, is uh, is breath. You know, mm -hmm. it's just literally just people in a room together breathing, and that's exactly why we can't. You know, people for so long couldn't be in a room together um, because like the air was full uh, uh, with with breath, with like people's with breath, with people's energy. You know. Um, and that is like an absolute, for me, like a tactile sensation of, uh, uh, of creation, of like, of, of a moment, of like, an, of an eventful moment, you know? Um, and so when that is, when, when, when that's gone, I think that is what, where like a certain anxiety or fumbly or clumsiness comes from the way that we are trying to figure, you know, everyone has been at some level trying to figure out how to communicate through these remote platforms, you know, uh, whether it's like, whether it's Zoom or even, or even like we've been trying to do it for years in the advent of social media, you know, trying to figure out how to make that feel real, that feel live and like, and like human. Um, so like it's, it's, and, and again, part of it is trying to figure out what's the breadth of these platforms, you know, what's like the event, the liveness of these platforms. And for many people, including myself, I'm like, I'm, I say to my, my first instinct is absolutely not. <laughs> like it doesn't work. It's not, it's not gonna work. So let's just like hunker down until like we're all, everything's back to quote unquote normal. Of course, that's not gonna happen. And people have like instincts to like connect. So then what do you, what do you do? What do you do from there? And how do you fill that? How do you fill that void that's inherent or that feels inherent um, in, in, I guess for what I'm talking about now, remote communication. In the space itself, like nothingness, I think does have like plenty to, to offer, uh, which I think is a big part of what's fun about, what was fun continues to be about this project is and this opportunity is like, oh, you know, Christ, we get to just not have an audience for a second and just like totally mess around <laughs> a little, you know, a little bit or do something that just, we just no normally wouldn't think about. I can't tell you the number of times where I felt like I was breaking rules. Like I really, like I was in the building, there's nobody there, but like somebody's gonna check the mail kind of thing. <laughs> But just like being there with no one there, I just I couldn't help but feel like I was like breaking the law in some kind of way. Yeah. Um, we <laughs> we can expand on that shortly. Angel, I wanted to give you a chance to weigh in here on like, yeah, I mean, for example, yesterday was my day off, <laughs> whatever that means. But like, it just I was. There's, there was no quiet in my mind. There was no quiet in front of my face. There was no quiet in my life. I felt like nothingness was really difficult to access actually in this moment where theoretically there's nothing going on. Um, but Angel, yeah, as an artist, do you think it's even possible to like have a real experience of nothingness? Yes, I'm all about Murphy's law, you know, if, the idea exists and yes, it's a possibility for sure, you know, and, um, you know, Kurt, you were saying some things that I was just like really uh, thinking about when you were talking about breath and like these platforms and I'm thinking like, I don't think that we can make these non-human platforms feel human. I think you're absolutely right. Like, it's just not gonna work. Like, so we have to reimagine these spaces. I don't think we need to make them more live. I think we need to make them less live and make them more what it is, which is a robot, <laughs> you know, like these are machines. Now we worship them, you know, we're at their mercy. And that's the thing that they don't have. They don't have breath. You know what I mean? Like they don't have breath, they don't breathe. And so I don't think that there's a way for us to, like we have to reimagine this completely. We have to do a whole new separate thing. I don't know what it is, but it has to be, it can't be us trying to make these platforms feel like you're going to a live show. 
it has to feel like, no, something new is on the horizon. We're doing a new thing with technology and stuff. And even when we get back to, you know, being able to be around each other and it's safe, um, I still think we should be exploring this as a medium for, you know, where, where we want to go artistically, you know? I mean, at some point people were like, you know what? I don't care what y'all saying. I'm gonna stick to writing with this feather. Nope, I'm not messing with no pencils or pens. Nope, I'm staying with the feather. You, you know what I mean? So like, how do we use these things here as like, okay, artists, these are here. Like, let's not avoid it and try to make it the old thing. How can we use it? And so I was really excited about trying to explore that. And, and a lot of the work that I'm doing now is trying to explore that like with visual mediums, like um, now's the time for all of us to be cross-pollinating as far as our artistic development too. Just because you've been, you know, an actor or in theater for a long time, what about exploring music and film or something else? Like, you know, um, even me like exploring more in my craft, like this time period is the time to level up on like, let's make our own films now. Like we now have the access to be able to do that. We didn't, the only reason why we weren't making our own movies back in the day is because it took all this money and you got to get all this. Now you can do like a whole film on your phone. Like we should be taking advantage of those and then mixing our practices that we've already had with that, you know? So like, this is a time for great innovation. You know, like it's an exciting time when it's void, when it's tohu wavohu, that's the Hebrew like, okay, because I know the, okay, I read the Bible a lot. <laughs> it says in the beginning, it was tohu wavohu, void and no. And they, and mythologically, they talked about them being like these kind of like great big beasts, almost like they were um, monsters, tohu wavohu. They were like, mm, you know, stirring things up. Everything's an abstraction. Everything's crazy and chaotic. Ooh, what is what? We don't know what's right. We don't know what's wrong. We don't know nothing. It's just an endless supply of just creativity. And then the deity comes in and says, let there be this. And then started to speak things into existence. This is how creation works. See, this isn't a story for you to be like, you know, let's argue about who's right or wrong. This is like teaching humanity something about how creation works. You know what I mean? Creation works in that way where it's void. And then you have to be specific and then carve out out of it whatever you choose, whatever it is you choose, you know? And that's how I look at my art. That's how I look at um me spiritually mentally all all everything that exists that's in my head if it exists then I explore it and see what it is and if you're like that like you never run out of creative ideas it's just like everlasting <laughs> you know absolutely and I mean I second your like critique of filmmaking as a medium for a really long time there's been all this gatekeeping yeah. Around actually just the concept like recording anything at all there's so much gatekeeping around like quality control <laughs> and production um which has like i think kept a lot of people from making work that now they're realizing they can absolutely make if they want um jasmine i want to throw this to you but also with the added inquiry about boredom like when I was first kind of researching you <laughs> and trying to learn more about, I mean, like we've met, but I was stalking you. And um, what I found were like a lot of videos that you had made in your apartment where you're like experimenting with light, where you're like listening to something where there's literally just like a ray of sunshine coming through like some blinds in your living room and you're moving around this ray of sunshine. And I'm curious, like what is boredom that sort of form of nothingness to you to a person who makes things are you ever bored i mean i'm definitely bored i'm a human so like i get bored sometimes but i first of all angel thank you like you're everything you just said i'm like so fired up by everything you just said i'm over here like ah, yes <laughs> Um, and I'm feeling so much of that. So I feel like I need, I would like to speak to that first. Um, but I, it just reminded me a lot about, you know, the ways that I've been trying to think of play and possibilities and because this is, and we've all been dealing with this. So I mean, I'm not alone in this, but like this 
shit has been so difficult like it has been so painful so like so painful and you know to like reimagine uh these ideas of exploration and play and possibilities and that there are endless possibilities makes me feel so full right now because last month or even when I began when I began my project the arts club I didn't feel that way I was like what am I what am I doing here like what you know and so yeah I think that I, I was thinking a lot about this um this piece that Katinka Katinka Klein and I filmed last night actually at Comfort Station and um it was a lot about let's just like bring everything together let's bring all of these ideas that we have together and let's explore all of them and it's like our little lab of like research um and I was like doing all this stuff that I've never done before and I was like this feels so good why haven't I ever done these things before like recording the sound of my voice in these lo-fi cassette players doing all of this like weird stuff with like cello and feedback and I'm like ah oh, this is like feeding a part of me that I've never explored and so yeah thinking about how these different things are being birthed out of this time of pain and um of and void uh and how that has felt like such a blessing right now um and I don't really I go back and forth between if if there, if I can, if an artist in general can feel complete emptiness, like the body holds so much. And, um, you know, there are times of emptiness within the body, but there's so much information there all of the time that I feel, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I don't have an answer for that, but, um, that's something to explore, you know, um, and I think, yeah, I don't, the boredom thing, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I think there are things that I feel bored about within the art world, but that's like a whole different other thing. <laughs> yes, I kind of wanted to ask that question because I keep hearing this refrain from like people who sort of are outside of the arts saying like, well, you're an artist, you make things, you must just like, you must just always have ideas. And I think about like the pieces that I've been making at home and what a, a very intense sl like slog it is to just get myself from one room to the next to go roll around under a blanket that I record as a thing, you know? Like it's really hard to be creative sometimes. Um, so I'm really thankful to hear all of this from all of you. I want to transition just a little bit to space because like in the performing arts, we think constantly about how we occupy space, right? Kurt was saying you can just occupy space with air, like with people breathing. And in a space like the arts club, it's pretty interesting to think about how a performance can share space, not only with an audience. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the arts club, there are several other arms to the institution. There's food service for one. There's a gallery with new works, always free, open to the public, currently showing Hervin Anderson, British painter, amazing, come by. And um, <laughs> there's also like a century old collection of historical works. And so sometimes it can be really easy to feel like collected yourself as an artist, like you've just been invited to grace a platform and fill the pages of an annual report, like so many pieces by mid-century masters gracing a wall. Um, and over the years, artists at the club um, have worked, artists the Arts Club has worked with have attempted to kind of subvert that dynamic of the fact that you're always negotiating with all these different arms of the club, um, like making their presence known through things like subtle intervention, for instance, industry of the ordinary, just put stuff out places. Like they put like some black flowers in the dining room that were just kind of like there. People could deal with them or they could not. They made a puzzle out of a Kusama painting in our collection, just put it up. They put like two busts of their heads in the drawing room. <laughs> like some people noticed and some people didn't. 
Um, some people have dealt with it through like circumnavigation. I remember this piece with Ginger Krebs and Elise Cowan, two dancers who um, had a big group of people just kind of tiptoeing around the edges of these really big monumental photographs hanging in the gallery and then ultimately outside of the building. I think about interruption, like Lori Waxman did a project about Fluxus ambulatory art where she invited artists to just walk around in our dining room during lunch hours <laughs> and through the building. Uh, and then also like the incorporation of dangerous, well, like to an art gallery elements into a performance, uh, Seth Parker Woods, um, sawed into a cello made of ice and there were actually like projectiles of black ice all over the gallery and there were like hanging pieces of glass with speakers on them um or like deconstruction amanda williams like literally broke down like kind of broke theoret conceptually broke down our fence and made it sort of collapse out into the garden or outright demolition and reconstruction. Um, Eliza Myrie, another artist, um, literally just built a gate into our fence so people could just come in. <laughs> and so in this special and weird moment, I was given a chance to like work around a lot of these negotiations. Like you want to go in the kitchen? Great. Okay. Want to wrap yourself in a garden hose? Run around the incredibly cramped backstage area where we store all the chairs? Yeah, sure. There's nobody here. You won't disturb anyone who's like happens to be here for lunch or drinks, but not your performance. The audience isn't in the room, as we've all mentioned, so you won't be able to feel if they're energetically into the performance or not. Strangely, there's kind of no one to please or impress. As you noted, Kurt, like sometimes it's nice to just not have an audience in the room. <laughs> So in this case, who and what, I'll ask you, Kurt, were you making for? How tangible was the thought of a virtual audience? Uh, tang tangible. I mean, uh, <laughs> I think like I found, I found in my first, in this first like endeavor in, in editing, putting, playing filmmaker, basically playing editor, um, uh, a natural tendency I had in in in, in on stage work uh, was was to really be very um, have an eye as an audience member. I think that's one strength or like where I connect in whenever I'm in a directing mode, because uh, that job is to be the the to be the eye of the audience and to ensure that there's focus that the focus is in the right place for the audience when they are finally invited into the room. And in my experience, and this might be fundamental or naive, but like it was my experience, like in editing, you totally have so much all the power to uh, uh, direct, direct the, the eye of the viewer or to think as an audience member the entire time because it's gonna be concretely, it's cemented there. Um, in in the video it's itself so like whenever i'm making if i when i'm when i'm editing the video i'm thinking as i'm think the audience is definitely with me in a lot a lot of different ways um in a way i become you know the actual live audience uh which is actually kind of fun which is actually like this is weird to say, but like I didn't necessarily I really have to kick myself in the butt to like sit up and like go, go, go and support another art, a fellow artist's work, you know, because I'm spending so much time like taking in like my at least in this filmmaking mode, I'm taking in what I'm making so often and not to sound whatever, but like I'm having a pretty fun time doing that, too, you know. Um, I think that changes with depending on like what kind of uh, uh, thing is, is is being made or shown. Um, but I, I I would say like that's it's the, the more I think about what I just said, the more creeped out I am by it. But I think like it's in a way um, not in a way I think it's a noble pursuit as an artist to like to find some joy in whatever absurd thing that you're making and in you know and I think maybe that's like where 
you can have a lot of fun in like absurdity with abstraction if you're not, if you're able to skip the part that is about anxiety around what judgment or, or what judgment might come from like an audience, you know, the, the kind of thing that we're constantly like reflexively blaming our audience. It's a bad habit, but like it's, it happens all the time. It's like, oh, they didn't get it. They're not going to get it. You know what I mean? Um, so like, I don't know. It is like, I, I'm, I'm teaching some students right now at, at a university and they're, they're, they're theater students that have been in Zoom University, they called it for like over a year uh, at an intensive acting program. And they expressed like being so hungry to be, to, to feel and hear and experience an audience um, that I, you know, I hesitate to say everything that I just said, because I don't want to like find myself fetishizing the like, you know, art for art's sake of myself, you know, too much. Um, there is a, there is a part of the audience that's not, there is a part that like we absolutely have to get in front of people again, you know, to do a thing that we're steadily forgetting how to do. Thank you. Yeah. And like that, I that hadn't occurred to me yet. Like that as a person who's making video work, you're the audience. Yeah. Like you literally get to be the audience and you never get to do that when you're on a stage. That's really interesting. Um, Angel, <clears throat> I want to throw this to you. You were actually the only person in this project who like addressed an audience. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, about that and about like why you chose to address the audience and like what the feeling of an audience was for you in this empty room. Oh no, I think you're- Sorry, you're, can you hear me now? You, Sorry. Yep, you're good. Um, yeah, I always, uh, no matter what I'm doing, I'm addressing an audience. And um, Arthur, Arthur Jaffa, he's like one of my favorite ever cinematographer he, he he talks about how all his work is addressing black people all the time and he gives the example of like um eric clapton like all like i think all his like most of his love songs were directed toward this particular woman now anybody and everybody can listen to eric clapton's music and enjoy it and love it and all that but he was addressing a particular thing and all of my work addresses that it, it's always addressing the audience of me being a black artist in a white supremacist world it always is <laughs> it never turns off and it's presenting that in a way that i can deal with it because that's really one of the things that i wake up to every day every day it never turns off and so the only way that I know how to be able to deal with being in that this type of world is to artistically manifest it through my music and work and um, especially the work of black musicians. So I really wanted to, when I get opportunities, I always wanna take the opportunity to um, present to the world what black music really is it's not hip-hop it's not classical music it's it's everything and um also wanted to i'm speaking to an audience to show little black girls too that oh here's a composer you know because like when i most people meet me and they say angel what you do it's like oh i'm a musician this is the first thing they say they say oh do you sing you must dance or sing or something right because it's unfathomable in somebody's mind that a black woman could be a recording engineer, could be a producer, could be a composer. It, like, it doesn't even cross people's mind, you know, but somebody who lives in that, um, you know, that's something, those are things that I have to address. And so I am am definitely always um, the audience that I want, that I, that, that I think needs to be seen and heard are those that are not seen and heard in their correct light and narrative, which is black people, which is me. <laughs> so um, this definitely was a big opportunity for me to be able to be on stage and to present to the world, this is really what black music looks like, okay? It's not, it shouldn't be shocking that I could write a sonata. And I wrote that stuff in two weeks, you know? Like the whole thing was written in two weeks. And I'm not the only black person who's writing music. Like Isaiah is a composer himself. 
You know what I mean? And so it's just like, that is definitely my, I'm very specific about what my art is to do because you have to be. I don't want some ambiguous, you know, reason for why, like entertainment for why I'm an artist. No, I believe art is just as powerful as any political position in the world. And frankly, this position that we're in in this world right now, I don't like it. I hate it. I really hate it. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, well, I'm not a politician. I'm not in Congress. And I don't even like these governments. I don't like any of them. Like Bob Marley said, that they're all, they're all illegal. Every government in the world is illegal. So what am I supposed to do if every government in the world is illegal and they're all not right and they ain't trying to do right and they especially ain't trying to do right to Black people? But I got to live in this. I have to be an artist. You know what I mean? Because um, one of my favorite movies, my childhood movies, was Mary Poppins. Y'all remember that scene where it was like he went to the park and then they drew on the sidewalk and then they would jump into and it's super calitrat. They would go into another world. That's what art is do. That's why they attack us and hate us because we're able to open up you to another world. We don't have to have this world, y'all, where racism exists. It doesn't have to be like this. You know, and so like if I don't be really focused on that, it's still going to just sit there. It's going to look like it's all gone away, but it's still there. That's what happened last summer. It wasn't like, oh, things got worse. No, 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 no. That shit been there. It, 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 y'all, just People just weren't thinking. It's always just rumbling underneath and I can't stand it. So, yeah, I'm very specific about my audience all the time, period. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for that, Angel. And I mean, the idea of like speaking to a world that is idealistic, um, that exists outside of the one that we have to exist in. Um, speaking of other worlds, I think I would like as a last question, just to get even further out than we already have been, um, I'd like to talk a bit about the supernatural, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, Kurt, like, Livia can't get to the stage because she's constantly being sucked into portals to other parts of the building. <laughs> Jas um, Jasmine, you, as you've described, uh, well, your character who I'm going to ask you about uh, is kind of an alien aquatic creature discovering the world and itself. Uh, Angel, in your piece, you reference often, like, the ancient things and ancient hidden things which is like has been in my head for many many days implying for me maybe the presence of ancestral spirits even in an empty place and so even though there weren't actual bodies in the space to be our audiences for all of you it did seem like maybe there were we'll say entities involved in some form or another um I want to throw this to Jasmine and ask you to first maybe describe your character. Talk a little bit about that being and why you chose that. Yeah, I mean, mm, I feel like there's so much there for me. Um, the character, I mean, I think it really started to kind of flourish for me when I was thinking about and resonate with a lot of the things that Angel was just talking about as a queer person of color, um, th that things are always like rumbling um, underneath the surface. And um, this time of creation, uh, specifically in the arts club, um, have brought up a lot of like the, the pain that was already there for me and um and thinking about like the ways i have felt like i've been drowning um and kind of like drowning in this place of pain um from like a collective grief place and also like personal um grief and loss and so for me this character was a lot about pleasure and pain and grief and release and ease and joy um, and letting stripping myself of my humanness and embodying this um, this like weird entity that I was like fascinated with 
becoming like I started doing a lot of research about like coral reefs and um, kind of just like these like weird underwater things that were reminding me um, about the ways that like my family has been drowning underneath the surface of all of these um, th you know things that are happening in this world um, and it reminded me a lot about uh, one of my tias and my ancestors who you know swam across the Rio Grande to reach West Texas to uh, reach safety and um, and new possibilities and outcomes for life and existence um, and family. And so, yeah, I mean, this character was so many was so many different things. I, it it was scary. It was unknown. It, it's still being explored. Um, there was so much curiosity. There was a lot of sadness there for me, but. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? I feel like I forgot what I was even <laughs> saying. <laughs> That's great. I just wanted to learn a little bit more about the character that you chose. I appreciate that. And I want to also give Kurt, and well, I want to hold what you just said, Jasmine, and thank you for that vulnerability. And thank you for sharing that with us. Like, I feel like a lot of us can, in fact, identify with this feeling of drowning this year. And yeah, thank you. And I, yeah, I want to give Kurt and Angel, I'm seeing that we have only a couple minutes left, but I want to give you two the chance to speak to this um, presence of the supernatural in the void that we were oh, recording in. There was so yeah. much energy up in there because like in that particular room, there's a Picasso in there. There's there's two things. There's a Picasso, but then as you exit, there's a um, a big statue from like the 1600s, right? From an African village, right? Uh, it's 1901 uh, Burkina Faso. Yes. Yeah. So you have two things. So like if people don't know, like Picasso, a lot of his art, he drew from ancient African stuff. And so both of these two, these energies are in that room you know, they're in there. And I'm just like walking around and it's heavy. It was like real heavy. And so like on our way out, I was like, can I like just touch that thing? I asked permission, I didn't just touch it. And when I did, it was so intense. It was like, so intense. So it's like, even though we were empty in that room, you know, like, there's Picasso brush strokes. There's Picasso DNA in there, literally. There's paintings all over the wall. You know, there's new art downstairs. You know, it goes back to the, you know, super califragilistic, you know, like there were so many, there's so many portals in that space. And when I was approached to do this, um, they, you, you, you were so kind to give me the art book clubs and I looked through the books and I looked at the lineage and the in the background and the history of why spaces like that are important you know whether it's filled with an audience or not spaces for art to be presented we need them and we need to support them so thank you and I felt all those energies from even the people who I know y'all had an original building and this is the new building, but it, it didn't matter what the building is. The spirit is there, <laughs> you know, the same spirit of the people who um, wanted the arts club Chicago to exist because it was a little different. It was for people who like we ain't trying to see the same art all the time. We want to see something different. We want to see something new and innovative, you know, and um, it, I think bringing us together Kurt and Jasmine and, and thank you guys for your art it's been wonderful seeing what you produce as well um and us having this conversation about art I think it's a really beautiful thing so thank you thank you Angel Kurt you want to you want to grab the last one Angel set you up perfectly with portals <laughs> no I yeah I can be I can be quick I was laughing earlier when you said you're going to bring this up because I think I'm like I like I like to fancy myself like equal parts like um, uh, 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 witchy and other parts, but like totally like pragmatic. <laughs> and I think I have like the most like pragmatic piece of, of, you know, it's basically an open closed door comedy. So when you describe it as like there's entities that are like shooting Livia across the thing, it's like kind of, but it's also supposed to be a big part of it is supposed to be like a film joke, 
you know, kind of like a, a laughing at the thing itself. Um, but I will say like, for my piece, like we find it, uh, uh, it goes to this place, it starts, that joke starts to kind of crumble. And that was, that's definitely part of like the mission of the, of the play. Um, and then it's like Livia just like looking at like the empty space um, and, 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 and relishing in it. Um, and a big part is that what she's doing is she's showing Blake, the camera person behind the camera, her job is to just walk around and show him like, check this out. And one of my favorite parts of the play, of the play is that she shows Blake um, uh, an empty, just an empty coat, not coat hanger, but a picture hanger and says like, that's awesome. And then afterwards, Blake was like, I'm sorry, I like, you know, she told me to look up there and then there was nothing there. I'm sorry I did that. I was like, no, she was showing you like, this is awesome. This is like, this is a coat hanger or this is a picture hanger with no picture, you know, like trippy, right? That's a thing. Um, so yeah, I know. I think that's like a big part of like making in the emptiness is that you have to like, when you're like alone or it's like a void, you're trying to like find that fun and that weird you know, which is in all the stuff that I think Jasmine and Angel are, are talking about as well. Um, and accessing that and like channeling it as an artist, but also as like a human being. Thank you, Kurt. Mm -hmm. and thank, thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Expo. Um, quartet of practical witchy people in touch with the entities here um, just <laughs> signing off and thanking you all so much for being with us I'll turn on my camera thank you everyone bye bye bye, bye.